Yo. 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 I dime a Raycon Built into the music that's not gonna make my head nod Focus on the subject matter Words make sense Paragraphs form together My thoughts are less dense See you scoping from the sidelines Hoping that I slip But I struggle long enough Bags packed for the trip But I'm quick to help a nigga out Heart full of gold Rep the city of the skills In the city from the soul God damn I'm on top and I'm feeling it Loose cannon bar stack lovely After bars get spit till you're feeling it Tip drilling and I'm in the streets with my vocals Parley with the locals showing love like I'm supposed to Strength with the flow, so I move gravity Gradually, you will see ain't not another nigga after me Quick to spit a verse with E-Rocks on the gray pad buttons In the lab with the extra percussionists How we do? How we do? Nowadays it's like So I'ma do it to my death Rockin' for my people on the left People on the right get lit Heads nodding to the flows that I spit I came from nothing in this game, so I floss my accomplishments. I hit the stage and leave crowds in astonishment. Run up on me and I'll give you this admonishment. Thou shalt not fuck with tech, cause I spark shit. Cause I do this for the culture. These vultures clandestine with their motives in the game, trying to take over. But now, soldier, it's time you retreat. It's all love when I'm crafting this seat for you and me. Hey, yo, the time is right now for me to spit this. Stupendous, relentless, stanza of a rhyme, kind sentence. It don't make sense, then adjust your bandwidth. Talk shit, get the swift back. Can like Stan Smith, niggas in the whip riding shotgun with the fifth. Beats knock out the 12 inch wolf for that kick. Steady shining when I do what I did. Niggas got on the assist, mad love to the city of Madrid. How we do? How we do? Nowadays it's like. So I'ma do it to my death. Rocking for my people on the left. People on the right get lit. Heads not into the flows that I spit. And we are live with Musicians and Makers podcast, dedicated to interviewing and promoting artists uh, and musicians across a broad spectrum of genres and mediums. Uh, and today we are joined uh, with Eric Bannister, uh, aka Gravity Movement. Uh, and you've just heard track Madrid by DJ Tech One uh, and by Eric. And uh, you had a little bit to do with that track? Yes, actually, I produced the track. Um, DJ Tech One, he's a, a producer as well. Um, but he and I are we are close friends and we've been building, creating music together for years. And we actually have um, kind of a side group called Soul City. We haven't released anything yet under that name. Uh, but as far as projects, when he creates anything, I'm usually, I usually have a couple of productions on it. And uh, when I put out projects, he usually has a couple of productions on it as well. So um, yeah, we're just producer buddies who, you know, just collaborate all the time. That's cool. Something to bounce off of too. That's nice to have. Absolutely. So this this song is coming out this year. We haven't seen anything on your Bandcamp's profile since 2018. So what have you been up to the last couple of years? Man, yeah, just rebuilding. Uh, rebuilding my library. Um, trying to establish a platform actually in which I could license music. Mm. Uh, I've been selling music for quite a long time, and you know creating music for rappers and singers and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, but really my ultimate goal now is to create music that can be used for multimedia purposes, mm -hmm. um, television placements, movie placement, um, corporate placements. But I want to create the platform um, in a way where 
it's a library and people can just come there and look for a certain style or feel or genre of cool. my style of music mm-hmm. and use it for whatever they want to use, license it for a certain amount and use it for whatever they want to use it for. It's more lucrative, number one, uh, because it's, it's almost like selling stock photography. Mm-hmm. Um, and as there are other sites that sell stock music, unfortunately, a lot of that music really doesn't have any um, any soul to it. Really, it's not great. Yeah, no, it's, it's not. Yeah, I've done, yeah. I've done a couple like different YouTube channels and like you know try to borrow some of that stuff. And man, like even like I'll try to get like a rock song, and they're pretty corny. It's right. <laughs> it's it's real rough. Right, they're pretty flat. So, and yeah. just like you said, you want to use stuff for YouTube, and there's other people who want to use things for Instagram. Mm-hmm. And they can't use music that's already out. They can't use it or their videos will get taken down. And people are produ- creating videos like a million videos a minute. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I feel like if I, I have a place in that in, as far as creating music for that. And I think also my music kind of is, I don't want to say theatrical, but it, it creates a certain feeling, a certain mm-hmm. mood, a certain mm-hmm. vibe. And I feel like um, if used in that way, it could be it could be very powerful. I've been creating music for so long, mm. trying to create music for rappers and singers. It's kind of like a headache, you know, chasing people <laughs> down for 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 vocal tracks and yeah. you know trying to align myself with people who create music like how I create music. Because mm-hmm. um, I'm not into you know a lot of the a lot of negative stuff being embedded in my music because that's not who i am i don't have anything against it and i listen to what people may call negative or hardcore or trap or stuff like that but as far as my music is concerned i don't really want that embedded in my sound you know that that seems like a tough piece for me you know for me like i'm a musician i play guitar but it's always been like with a band or my own project but we always have like that 100 percent control in that direction to write something for others to use. Yeah. I, I can imagine that's like, sometimes it's hard to digest when you see what the finished product looks like. Yes. And the thing is too, like I have 11 year old son, right? So mm-hmm. I don't want to create things that I can't play for my 11 year old son. Like, mm-hmm. I, and that, and to some that may sound kind of corny, like, well, make what you want to make and you know, whatever that com- comes with that. But the yep. things that I want to make are things that I feel could influence him, the things that um, reflect who I am. I have a choice to do that because I create. Mm -hmm. Whereas some people, when they're in a certain position as far as their music is, their career is concerned, they have to do a certain thing because Mm -hmm. of the the lane that they took. And then when they get to a certain point in their career, they want to actually be who they are. It's weird because we already know you for something else. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. yeah, you see that all the time. Somebody releases a new project and it's completely different, and you're just like, "It's yeah. good," but yeah, <laughs> it's not what I definitely, want, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To speak to your son too, he's doing some music now too, right? You released some songs with him. He is, um, and actually, his project will be coming out pretty soon. Um, his nickname is Yoshi, so um, the name of the project is Yoshi Moto Beats Volume One. And uh, I've been spending time with him, like giving him the the room to create what he wants to create. And mm-hmm. honestly, some of the stuff he's creating is really dope. So uh, we're gonna put that out this year. And you know, he's been he's been he was playing the drums on his own. Mm. I didn't teach him since he was like five. Wow! Oh wow! He's that's he's, awesome. He has his music embedded in him, so he wants to make some money. You know what I mean? So I'm like, okay, this could be your first business opportunity. Sure. You put yeah. it on a couple of platforms. But yeah, I'm very close uh, with my son. And the things that I do, I don't want to have to, you know, not be able to do it fully around him. I want to be organic, starting with him, all the way up to you guys. It's like it, mm-hmm. it, I need, it needs to be consistent for me all the way across the board. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely understandable that's great too like man started at five years old when did you start making music i started making music well actually producing music yeah i was about 16 prior to that you know back in the day you had to like we had to record music off the radio mm-hmm. so i was like pretty good and pretty known for catching all the good music off the radio and putting together little pause tapes or mixtapes 
even with that, I used to try to like loop beats with a cassette tape to make the extend <laughs> the beat to make them longer. But at 16, a music uh, teacher at our school, he was a music teacher and a DJ. Um, and I kind of got into DJing first. Um, all my friends, a lot of well, not, not all of them, but a good amount of my friends were DJs. So we, mm -hmm. we kind of would playing around with the DJ and they stuck with the DJ and I kind of moved into production. DJing was a little crazy to me because buying vinyl was just too expensive. And this is in, you know, this is in the 90s. So mm. buying vinyl was just way too expensive. So I went into the beat making part and I learned from a guy named Mel B, DJ Mel from Peace Skill, New York. And he has a he had a studio way back then. So mm. he started teaching me how to sample and um, you know, the basics, metronomes, timing, um, all, all the basics that come with sampling and kind of song structure, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, just started making beats and, you know, had a couple of friends that rapped and we made a couple of tapes and stuff like that. And back then just knew we were going to be the hottest thing out in the next <laughs> two years. We weren't. <laughs> um, <'cause back> then, <laughs> You know, the music skate was even more competitive and more creative back then. Um, but since then, I'm thinking around two, 2000, I got my first MPC. And from there, that's when I really, really, really got into making my own projects and stuff like that. Do you still mix in a lot of like analog equipment or have you kind of moved to all digital? I kind of moved to all digital. Um, I still have my MPC. However, the one that I have, I have the 2000 XL. The one that I have, it's hard to integrate it with computer. Mm. And recording on analog is something totally different. I like to record into my computer. Mm. But what I do is I try to, I still try to use my computer and use my software in an analog way. I try to keep things sounding how they would sound if they came out of my MPC. I don't want things to be too clean. I don't want things to be mm. too crispy. Because if you listen to a lot of music, like especially on these streaming platforms, it's just highly compressed music mm -hmm. that doesn't have a lot of range. And it just, mm -hmm. it just, it's it's too compressed to me. And I get it. You they want to get the volume up and they want the volume to sound the same across. I get all of that. But it to me, it kind of takes something out of it. So I try my best to equalize it in a way where it sounds like it's coming off of a tape or coming off of a uh, of vinyl. Mm. No, once you put it on a platform, it's already, it's going to be processed anyway. Yeah. But I try mm -hmm. to just give it a sound that's somewhat analog. I mean, I could give it more of an analog feel, but then you kind of lose some of the thump too. So I just try to keep it in between as far as the end result. Yeah. I mean, you know, I feel like everything that I release nowadays the the vinyl is the one that's going, you know what I mean? That's the sound people are looking for, you know? Yeah. So to keep that through and through, absolutely. Yeah. It makes perfect sense to me. And all these platforms, the Skypes and the YouTubes, they're just trying to get as many files as they can, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and it's yeah. real easy to compress that down and fit them all, but yep. you're not going to yep. get that quality. So to see you pushing for that, that's, yep. that's what makes it special. That's beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do you have a preferred beat making software that you use? Well, right now I'm using Logic. I started with Cubase. <laughs> I don't even know if people still use Cubase. Actually, I started using GarageBand um, and was kind of doing some crazy things with GarageBand. That's when I, I was using GarageBand and my MPC at the same time. But mm -hmm. I just moved into um, I just moved into to Logic, and I mean I love Logic. I really really love Logic. It gives you the ability to make things sound how you want them to sound in a sense. Mm. I guess you could do that with any software, but I it, I figured out how to make things sound like if I want if it was coming out the NPC. One of the characteristics of the NPC that makes it such a a beautiful machine is the timing that it has. Mm. It has this 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 timing and this grit that gives you a sound that when you hear it, you can almost say, I think that's done on the NPC. But mm -hmm. I kind of figured out how to do that same thing in Logic. My professional trade, I'm a graphic designer. So I'm always using, I'm working on a Mac. And 
being that logic is native to Apple, you know, products, it just makes it a little bit easier to jump into that as well. Yeah. And that graphic design work too, uh, you know, scrolling through your Instagram, I saw that like you started to kind of line up some like videos that you made uh, with like some of your music uh, to help get into that feel. I think that's an awesome direction to go. Uh, can you tell us a little more about that process? I've been creating these small, <laughs> one of my friends calls them, calls them infomercials. I've, I've been creating small <laughs> videos with my beats and just finding footage to add to the beats just to kind of demonstrate, well, kind of do two things, kind of demonstrate how it would work with a video if someone was looking for music to add mm-hmm. to their professional video. But then the second thing is I'm really about feel. So if I make a beat, if it makes me feel a certain way or or when I hear it, I see something, then mm-hmm. I go look for it and I try to I try to put the two together. I really I'm a true believer of music is an audio medium, but it's it's also a visual medium. Mm-hmm. So like when you hear something or you're playing something, you can see something, that's when you know like you're in a zone because you can actually see what you yeah. what you hear translates into something that you can actually see. So I try to kind of drive that point home with those videos that I make mm. to kind of give the viewer or the listener something that they can take to the next level. So if I make yeah. a song and to like I have a song called um Coconut Rum, I think it's called. And mm. I just kind of took all these beat shots and island shots and kind of just put them together and just in doing that just trying to create that escape for at least that minute or however how long it is for the person who's watching and listening like take them somewhere else Mm. because i also believe that sometimes if you ask someone well what does what's gravity movements music sound like you may not be able to describe what it sounds like but if you can describe how it makes you feel, to me, that's even better. Absolutely. If somebody could say, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but it makes me feel like this or it makes me feel like that. Mm. To me, that's more impactful than saying, oh, it sounds like boom bap or it sounds like trap or it sounds mm-hmm. like this. Like, I don't mind that, you know, being categorized in any of those ways. It's whatever. But I would prefer somebody to say it makes it feels like this or yeah. it feels like that, you know. Yeah, I think about um, – I don't know if you're familiar with Bonobo. He's a, a lo-fi artist and um, there's one album cover. It looks like it's like – I think it's like a volcano and mm-hmm. it's he made it for like a digital release. So like the fire is just moving the whole time on the cover mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and just – it's one of the, like the only like albums when I listen to it. I also like keep that video up. You know, like it just like – it has the feel. It feels right. And it makes the mood too. Uh, for me, like I listen to music with people. You know what I mean. I like music right. where I can just put it on in the background with a group of people around. Right. So if I have like something like that looks pleasing as well, you know, that just that makes it for me. What did you say the artist name was? Uh, Bonobo. Okay, I check them out. They're fairly pretty big at this point, uh, but yeah, no, just cool looking track. So where are you from? I'm from Peekskill, New York. Um, some people say that's upstate New York. Realistically, it's not upstate. Um, <laughs> it's just outside of the boroughs. It's about 40 minutes outside of the Bronx. It's the smallest city, city in Westchester County. Westchester mm-hmm. County um, borders the five boroughs. And um, in Peekskill, while I was there, Peekskill was fill, filled with so many talented people, mm-hmm. um, all types of artists and just so many talented people. And I think because of that, that kind of shaped and molded me in a way where I create how I create. So um, I left Peace Skill uh, after I went to college in Edinburgh U- University, which is up in um, Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, northwestern Pennsylvania, um, came back to Peace Skill. And shortly after, I moved to Virginia, northern Virginia. And then was there for a couple of years. And then I moved down to the Raleigh area in North Carolina. Um, and, you know, my family's from down here. It's home now, but it was always like my second home because my family's from down here. Mm-hmm. Um, but m- my sound is definitely um, influenced 
by mm. New York and the 90s era and everything that was happening at that time. Were there a lot of like venues in Peekskill? Did you guys kind of have to like go to the city to get more of that? No, nah, there wasn't a lot of venues. Um, there were like talent shows and, mm-hmm. you know, there would be show slash party type events. And then there would be a couple of concerts every now and then. But then, you know, we would have to go go further down mm. um, into the city, which was nothing. It was just like, you know, either jumping on a train or yeah. just hopping in your car and take a little short ride to, the, you know, to the Bronx or mm-hmm. downtown or something like that. I feel like what was there, <laughs> as far as talent is concerned, it was just so, <laughs> it was so much. It was so rich that we didn't have to do that. You know what I mean? It was It was like this incubator of of talent there so it's crazy just fed off <laughs> each other instead yeah. absolutely so how do you balance life and art in your life now oh man it's hard <laughs> <laughs> it's hard it's hard um steve watched me like down a taco by the way before we started this because yeah. <laughs> i was i was having a hard time balancing my life <laughs> and my passions <laughs> today <laughs> sometimes it's hard i am i'm married i have 11 year old son I have a full-time job working for the city of Raleigh, and here I am making music still. (laughs) Yeah, nothing wrong with it. Um, And, you know, first of all, I have to be responsible as far as being a husband and a father. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I have a wife who is understanding of how I feel about music and how I feel about creating. So she gives me space to kind of move but if things are getting off track, you know, she'll kindly remind me. You know <laughs> what I mean? Because at one point, to be honest, I wasn't balancing it well. Like I would just mm-hmm. go into my my area where I make music and not come out. Mm-hmm. You know, like you wouldn't see me for a day or two. And to an artist, that's like, oh, that's dedication. That's mm-hmm. that's the grind. That's how you support. But when you have a family your family actually comes first. You know what I mean? And you have to accept that and you have to live your life in a way where that is reflected. Mm. Like even this, this is, it's us talking, but I'm telling, I told my wife, look, I'm going to do this at this time. So Mm -hmm. this is my time to do that. You know what I mean? Versus I'm here and now somebody's knocking on the door (laughs) and you take the garbage out. Can you do this? Can you do that? So and it's just, you know, just respecting your, your spouse when you do stuff like that. Mm. Then, as I told, as I said before, I'm a graphic designer. And I used to do a lot of freelance work. But then I, I came to a point where I said, I'm not doing it anymore because I was spending more time creating for other people than I was myself. And I started to become bitter towards people yeah. because here I am helping you build and create your dreams. Meanwhile... I got tracks over here I haven't finished. And that's yeah. a part of my dream. You know, when you create graphics for a person who is starting a business and you see the excitement in them and you're trying to do everything you can to point them in the right direction and set them up and get their brand going. And after it's done, you sit back and you look at yourself and it's like, man, I didn't <laughs> even put that much energy in myself, yeah. you know, these past couple of weeks. So I stopped doing freelance work. And whatever time that I have outside of family and work and, you know, whatever else I'm doing, it's my time to to build what I want to build. But again, it's just finding the balance between all things that are important. And I I think as I've gotten older, I've learned, too, that when to stop, you know, like Mm. I could I could start making music at 11 o'clock and still be making music at 11 o'clock the next morning. Mm-hmm. And it really and it really wasn't productive. You know what right. I mean? It was just it was just time being spent. I've learned how to actually use my mind more, if that makes sense. Mm. Like I can I could be working on a beat, I could walk away from it, but it's still in it's still head. playing in my head. Yeah. And I'm still thinking what sound would go with that, what sound would go with that. So I might come back in, turn it on for a couple of minutes, turn it off and walk back out. And then let it play in my head and let it play in my head. And then think about what does this feel like? What, like I do a lot of analyzing because mm-hmm. I know if you know, if you know the software that you're using and whatever, make the keyboard, whatever you're using, you already mm-hmm. know the mechanics of it. You know what it can do. 
So it's like start thinking about what I have to click, where I have to go. Like I'm start, I'm like literally thinking about what I'm gonna do when I turn my computer back on. Mm-hmm. And, and I've learned for me, once I turn it back on, things start just going like this because I've been thinking about it all, all for however long I've been thinking about it. I think that comes from being a graphic designer. You kind of think of scenarios of how to arrange things. Because yep. that's all being a graphic designer is, is arranging mm. things and things where it, and you're thinking about it and you're thinking about it. And I kind of started doing the same thing with music. So it cuts my actual work time, I won't say in half, but it mm. cuts it down a great deal. Because when I get back on, I've already done some experimentation in my mind. Mm. I guess yeah. it's kind of like how, <laughs> how rappers say they just, they don't write. You know what I mean? They just start rapping. With just get in the box. Hard yeah. To <laughs> yeah. yeah. I kind of, kind of just create music in that way where I'm doing it. I'm kind of thinking about it so much when I get back on, I know yeah. what steps I'm going to take and what I want to do. Uh, with guitar, we always say, if you can hum it, you can play it. You yeah. know? So for yeah. me, it's like I can sit around do ba do 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 and then I might like take the phone and try to get a quick recording of that. You know what I mean? Because I know yeah. like once I sit down with it, I'll pick it apart in a minute, you know? Yeah. Right, right, right. If I could play I mean, it, eh, maybe we'll see. <laughs> I utilize the time in the shower. I utilize the time in the bathroom. Yeah. Throne, you know, just think, like, it has become more of a mental thing than uh, so much of an experimentation for me. Mm. It just gives me more time to actually get stuff done. I've been taking the bus more, and I was actually excited that I would have more headphone time. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. So uh, we are also talking to a fellow podcaster. You want to talk a little bit about uh, the Bare Minimum podcast? Oh, wow. OK. You guys is digging a little bit. OK. Did our research. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> While eating a taco real quick. But yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Whatever it takes. So, yeah, some a few friends of mine, uh, they came to me with the idea. They know I like to drink beer. Um, and they had a group a collective um, called The Talented Tenth, and they were creating short films, podcasts. They were doing a lot of multimedia things. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of them is a really close friend of mine, and she was like, you know, it would be cool if you did a, a podcast about beer with a guy that I know. And I'm like, first I was like, beer? <laughs> then I thought about it and was like, no, that's pretty dope. Yeah. And then I started looking into the beer world outside of just me going to the store and buying beer. Mm -hmm. And the beer world is a, it is a universe of its own. Like it is truly a universe of, and to be honest, there's not a lot of, as far as podcasts are concerned and um, Facebook pages and Instagram group pages and these different groups, there's not a lot of black guys who are actually doing it. Which mm. is was weird to me because I know a lot of black guys who drink beer. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was just like, you know what? There's a space for my perspective in it. You know what mm. I mean? And just, I just started, once again, my mind started cranking about how, one, we can introduce music into this. Two, how we can introduce just a personal lifestyle into it. Three, how I'm like an average guy. You know what I mean? I'm not a sophisticated guy, but average guys are interesting guys too. So mm-hmm. just taking a, just actually grabbing the concept of beer and everything that surrounds it, food, music, friends, yeah. movies, video games, like everything you can incorporate with drinking a beer. Yeah. I mean, I'm drinking a beer now, you know what yeah. I mean? So, <laughs> This could be the Beer Minimum podcast where we're talking about music. It just so happened that we're talking about beer, too. But the crazy thing is we started rolling with it and COVID hit. Yeah. So it was just like we had some recordings in the in the, in the can. And when COVID hit, we, we kind of paused for a minute. Then we went back and looked at those uh, episodes. And it's like, we got to do it a little bit better. Mm. So the funny thing is I was just talking to my partner, Troy Lee today and we were just discussing how we're going to test out some new um software where we can just do it like like how we're doing this right now Mm -hmm. yeah some new episodes should be coming out in the next couple of weeks and that's the thing about 
beer minimum too is it's talking about beer is easy. You know what I mean? It's not <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're not like we're not like beer nerds where it's like mm, you smell the hops and yeah, this yeah, yeah. Smell age. It's like nah, this tastes good. I bought it here. It wasn't expensive. Mm-hmm. Like just just casual conversation around beer. Yeah. Um, so yes, the beer minimum podcast. New episode should be dropping in a couple of weeks with my partner Troy Lee and and uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. So, and that's another thing too. Like, I didn't plan on. I never saw myself being involved with a podcast mm-hmm. as far as being in front of the camera, mm-hmm. behind the camera. Yes, um, but I never envisioned myself on it. You know, being in front of the camera, but. And yeah, hopefully some great things will come from it. Some, some maybe some great sponsorships. Um, and down here in North Carolina, there's a lot of breweries. Oh yeah, a lot of a lot of tours. So this this is the perfect place to do something like that. You know, absolutely. I'm a manager, bar manager, and you know I talk to like a million reps and brewmasters a day, and uh, I definitely think like even in the market itself, I don't see many black brewers i don't see Mm -hmm. many black distributors Mm -hmm. uh so you know even to not take it from a professional standpoint and to just be talking like this is what i like Mm -hmm. absolutely i think that's a great way to expand the market you know it it makes me think too like you know we we do this to like to interview artists and musicians and i'm like i'm sitting here going man it'd be so cool to like just talk to like a brewmaster on here too and like hear them talk about like how they create that taste and like you know what makes that final beer what makes that cut you know? Right. Right. I mean, honestly, we, we all know that music and alcohol go hand in hand, mm-hmm. whether it's Absolutely. beer, whether it's wine, whether it's whatever. It goes hand in hand. There are a certain group of people who love just to listen to music in a bar because yeah. it feels different. Like, yeah. I don't listen to rock unless I'm in a bar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to be yeah. honest with you, it's fitting for the mood it's loud mm-hmm. everybody's excited like it's just fitting for the mood so i don't see why you couldn't do it that would be kind Absolutely. of dope. It's sense <laughs> to me when we renewed that uh, we uh we redid our bar like a year ago and like it was kind of like you know make a list of what you want like what can we get and i can tell you the first thing we put in that bar was like a big old like base you know what i mean like <laughs> we wanted a big old sub we're like right because that's right. what you need you want to feel you know what i mean right. that's where it comes right. alive right I learned a lot about music just being in bars. Like, it's like when you hear a song, you don't know it's popular, but the reaction of the people around you tells you that it's popular mm. or that it's a hot song. Like, this is the song. Yeah. Um, I've learned a lot about music just by watching people react, like reactions in a bar. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Hit him with the beer question, Steve. Oh, dang it. You beat me to it, Josh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's, what's your go to mix and match six pack? right now if you if you had to make one trophy wife i definitely would put a heineken in there i'm like ooh, that was my dad's go-to that is my go-to yeah it's, it's my <laughs> faithful like if there's nothing else give me a heineken oh uh arrogant bastard oh yeah i love arrogant yeah. bastard stone, stone yeah i love that um great packaging too yes yes Actually, that line of beer, the IPAs, um, are great as well. Uh, mm. Oh, my goodness. I can't. That was a good one. You caught me off guard with that. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big Guinness drinker, so always Guinness. Yes, I love uh, Guinness. Riviera by um, R&D Brewing here in Raleigh. And then um, this Tangerine Express IPA. Great. That's mm. awesome. Is that a uh, fat tire? No, that is uh, Stone. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. It's the same people who make uh, Arrogant Bastard. Is Stone from North Carolina? Um, I thought that. Oh, they're California, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, nah, they're, okay. they're not North Carolina. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you were going all local. I got really excited for a minute. I would love to live next to the Stone. <laughs> <This is a brewery. laughs> Have you guys tasted. Um, the Modelo uh, Reserva, Re- I think it's called Reserva. The one I've, that had, has I've had the Especial and the Negro, Negro Modelo. It's the That's one that man. has a, a tequila taste to it. It was it's brewed mm. in tequila barrels. That sounds wild. 
I've had it plenty is. of like the Kentucky bourbon barrels and stuff, but yeah, it is kind of wild. It is kind of wild. Yeah, yeah, I'm a big but, like mezcal fan too. If it's got a little smoky to it, that sounds sounds yeah. pretty good. Voodoo Ranger, I like Voodoo Ranger. Yeah, IPA. awesome um, labels on that one too. Yes. Yeah, I think that's what attracted me to Voodoo Ranger. Like their package, the six pack packaging, the cans. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just when you see it on the shelf, it's like I want to try that. It grabs your yeah. attention, absolutely. That's how yeah. I shop for beer now. <laughs> it's, it's all look for me. If it, look, if it looks fun and insane, I'm in. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's kind of like um, <laughs> record shopping, almost like yeah. you know, going searching for records, old records, and using them to sample from and things of that nature. Mm. I usually just look at the cover. If it looks really crazy, like if it looks like everybody on the cover was high, you know, <laughs> if it's high in the seventies, like it's usually some awesome music on it, you know. Mm. So, so mm-hmm. I kind of judge beer the same way. If it looks dangerous, I'm probably gonna try it. <laughs> if it's hot outside and it looks like it's summery, I'm probably gonna try it. So yeah, yeah same thing. I get it. I definitely. Uh, so why do you make art? Well. As a job, I do it to get paid. Let's put, get that out the way. It's my career. Mm-hmm. But I think just the way I'm designed, my mind likes to explore different mm-hmm. scenarios, and different possibilities. For me, when I was younger, you know, I was the youngest of, you know, all my siblings and spent a lot of time by myself. So that was something that I just leaned on to do when I didn't mm-hmm. have anything else to do. Mm-hmm. I started drawing. And even when I was young, I, I knew, well, I didn't know I was going to be a graphic designer, but I knew I wanted to be a computer programmer or a lawyer. And it kind of leaned more mm-hmm. towards the, if you mix them together, <laughs> you kind of got a graphic designer. <laughs> I just like to explore different possibilities but as far as music, man, it's it's really just the feeling, man. Like I can remember being really young and hearing my brothers playing different old school hip hop songs and how they made me feel. And I always wanted to feel it over and over and over again. And that's kind of how I am with creating music. When I get something that feels good to me, it's like, okay, I did it. I've listened to it. I need to get another one. I need to get another one. So. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like I wouldn't say this. It's almost like an addiction. You searching for the for the goosebumps, like yeah. when you hit something and it's like you get that chill or the like that feeling that you get. It's like, oh, that's it. I just keep looking for that. And I kind of feel like my my music provides a space for people to think and just chill mm-hmm. or just imagine or just zone out like it it gives people a platform to just let their mind do what they wanted to do at the time Mm. i get joy out of that like i I just (laughs) i I feel joy out of playing something from somebody and just watching them kind of like listen to it and get into it and just Mm -hmm. like i i get i get pleasure out of that even if i was to never become this world-renowned artist I don't have to to love making music. Mm. If I didn't become that, maybe my position in this world of creating music was to inspire somebody else Mm -hmm. or be um, an inspiration for my son or be an inspiration for you guys or be an inspiration Mm -hmm. for my friends. Like every artist is not going to be, you know, Jay Z. Mm. Every artist is not going to be Basquiat. Sometimes your role as an artist is just to be a, the best artist that you can be. Maybe be a light for the people around you. I enjoy being that. I enjoy um, doing things like this. I enjoy it because of how it makes me feel. Mm. You know, like it allows me, when I get into making music, nothing else really matters at that time. Like I'm not thinking about anything else but what I'm doing. And I think music is probably one of those only things that does that for me to allow me to totally block out everything mm. and just focus on, man, that snare is too loud or that snare has something. And like, it just allows me to do that. I don't know how, well, where else you could find that and it's legal. 
You know what I mean? Like, not to say, you know, people got their own things they like to do. That's cool. But for me, it's just like, I don't know, man. There's nothing, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And like I said, I think about it so much, I can even do it when I'm not doing it. Like, I'm just thinking mm-hmm. about, like, what I'm gonna do next, or what's a new, a, a nice idea, and what, what what beat goes with what visual, like so. My love is based on those things. Hey, you're doing something right because you know the reason you're here today is not because you reached out and said I want to be on the show. It's because somebody else said you should reach out to him and and have him come on the show. You know, right? And like that's to me, man. Like you can't put you can't put a dollar amount on that. You can't measure that. That's a response to to what I do, and mm. I say that humbly. Like I'm I'm not saying that like I do this. I, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying like mm. something that I've done and made B feel like nah. He need you. You need to talk to him, mm. and he's an artist himself. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's like how to, I don't even know how to explain how that makes me feel. Like those type of things, or when somebody says, go listen to this, go listen to him. Or when somebody comments under a video that I put up, yo, this made me feel like this, or this mm-hmm. sounds like, like those type of things mm-hmm. feed me and keep me actually moving forward and keep doing mm-hmm. what I'm doing. Because otherwise, if I was basing it on success in the way that most people look at it, Oh yeah, I would have st- I would have stopped years ago. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. We're not all going to be. You're right. You're not. We're not all going to be Jay Z. <laughs> you know, we're not we're, getting there. We're, we're not, and it's yeah. and it's fine. It's fine, and, and and to be honest with you, like I'm sure we can we can uh, we can all say Jay Z has millions of millions of fans, mm. mm-hmm. but as individuals, working class guys, if we had five thousand mm-hmm. real fans mm-hmm. that bought our music oh, yeah. and came to shows, you could live. Yeah. Like, you don't need millions of fans. <laughs> you, you probably yeah. know half of them, too. You know what I mean? There's right. that connection. Right. And that, to me, is that's super important. You know, like, right. I've been playing in the punk scene for a long time, and that's one of my favorite parts about the punk scene, is you can know pretty much all your favorite artists, you know, and they're all there asking you how you've been, and they know your life story. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter if they're the biggest band on the block. Nope. It's about that community. Yeah. You know? If you sell merch, you can sell a lot of merch. You, like, there's so many avenues now in regards to music. You don't have to be this super big, huge, crazy artist to, to actually live off your art. Mm. And to me, that's a beautiful thing. You don't have to take the route of sounding like everybody else. You don't have to take the route of looking like everyone else. You don't have to take the route of, you know, selling yourself in a way where it's unnatural or uncomfortable for you. Because if we're selling something, we're selling something. But I'm not trying to sell my soul. You know what I mean? Like, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not that serious for me. Yeah. yeah. No. I'm not making a deal with any devil. No, thanks. No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. You don't have to do that in order to reach a level of success. If you find a nice little nice nice little niche or niche or however you want to pronounce it and mm-hmm. stay there and kind of just develop from there and keep developing a little bit more as time goes on, you can live. Okay. Well, can I'm live. I'm real happy you found your your niche, your niche. That's how I want to say it. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. I can't wait to crack open a beer, throw on your new track and uh, listen to an episode of Beer Minimum. And I want to thank you for being here today. It was awesome talking to you. Uh, Again, this is Eric Bannister uh, in Gravity Movement, uh, graphic design, podcaster. uh, And Eric, where can we find out some more about your projects? Uh, Well, right now, my last three projects are all on, you know, iTunes, Spotify, uh, Amazon, all the places where you can buy digital music. But all of my projects are on my Bandcamp page. I'm on Instagram, Gravity Movement. I'm on Facebook, um, Eric Gravity Movement Bannister. About me, uh, Gravity Movement. You can find out when I'm releasing things. 
Uh, but the next thing I, I'm definitely going to be releasing is my son's project. It's not my project. I'm just kind of helping him push mm-hmm. it through. So, and that was the other thing. We started Yoshi. his project, Yoshimoto yeah. Beats. And that was the other thing I said to myself um, once we started his project that I wouldn't put a project out until we finish his. Yeah. So that's another reason why there's been a, this part of the gap. Um, the other part of the gap was just trying to figure out how I'm going to do what I want to do. But yeah, like I think my the the platform I like to use the most is, is Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just it's it works well for me as far as being a graphic designer and a and a producer. I can do both things on there. But yeah, stay keep stay posted on uh, on Instagram, Gravity Movement on Instagram. Um, definitely looking to connect with more people, like real connections. Like, uh, you know, I talk to people. <laughs> <There's> people <laughs> it's, fu- it's funny because there's people that I've created music with that I've never met. Mm-hmm. I've only, I only know them virtually, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? But we've yep. never met personally. And those are some, these people that I never met are my biggest supporters. They buy mm-hmm. everything. And, mm-hmm. and it's just like, Wow, I wish I could get my friends to buy some of my oh, other yeah. friends to buy it, but that's just how that's just how it is. I don't take offense to it. It's just weird sometimes like that. Yep. Hey, I go to Europe and but people yeah. show up to my shows. I, I play in my own city and I got like two people there. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm usually one of the two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The guy that um the guy Tech One who's on who's uh I produce Madrid for. He made that song because he was on tour. He was in Madrid. And he gets mm-hmm. so much love in Madrid. Mm-hmm. Like, he gets so much love overseas. But here, it's just not the same. Like, they mm-hmm. they see music in a different way. And then when you come from all the way over here to go there just to perform, it's a whole other world. I keep saying it. We have the privilege to play music here. Yeah, you know, and you go other places uh, where they hold to such a high extent, and they're just so thankful that you put the time in to do something like that. Yeah, yeah, and as far as hip hop is concerned, it seems like they have a, a stronger grasp on the roots of hip hop mm. than we do here now. Mm. Like it's transformed into something different. Yeah. It's still hip hop, but they still hold on to the soulfulness of it and the I don't want to say skill because then that makes it sound like I'm saying it. newer rappers are not skillful. But mm. They just they just view it in a different way. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm definitely one of those people where like every time a new style of hip hop comes out, I'm like, this is not music. And then I have to stop myself. I'm like, no, wait, this is that's how it happens. Right. People evolve. Yep. People make it different. And I got to I have to respect that. That's it's huge. Yeah, it, it was hard for me at first. Because some of it, it really didn't make sense. Um, mm-hmm. It didn't make musical sense. It didn't. It didn't feel like anything special. But I had to say to myself, "You got young kids who are creating music when they could be doing something else." Absolutely. So that's number one. Number two. Sometimes you just have to get through the weeds to find the ones who are doing it in a in a way that's like, oh, okay, I see, mm-hmm. I understand. And then I don't want to be the bitter old guy either. That's like yeah. that's <laughs> not good music, you know, like yeah. that's that's trash. You can't be like that. So, but I will say when something is good and when it's not. However, mm-hmm. I can't categorize a whole group of music and or a whole generation of music and say that's trash. Like I, that's. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I catch myself. Yeah. Uh, we like, you know, B and I work at, um, at AS220, which is like a nonprofit art organization. And part of that, we have like a youth program and they'll use our performance venue for like their, you know, so they'll do like youth concerts, youth events. And I'm like, you know, walking by and I see like a bunch of like youth members in like these fake bulletproof vests. And in my head, I'm like, why are they doing that? And like, is that even legal? Can they do that? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like trying to call them out for it. And then like, you know, talk to like some of the youth leaders and everything. And they're talking about how like that's, they're pushing for, you know, the fact that like they don't feel safe on the streets. You know what I mean? Like when they're coming down to the city, they don't feel comfortable. They don't feel safe. And I, that's when I realized like, man, they put some serious effort into portraying a message that means a whole lot to them that I don't know a thing about. And it's just taking that time to realize that evolution. It's, it's important. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, for 
my parents, it probably was the same thing when I was young. Like they didn't, they didn't get what was actually going on. Mm -hmm. I think the difference now is my parents didn't grow up with hip hop. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? They were old and then they were introduced to hip hop. Sure. I grew up with hip hop. Mm. So I understand hip hop the same way my kids understand understands hip hop. It's a different model than it was mm. when I was young. So I try to keep in mind, okay, I know how it was late 80s, early 90s, 2000s. Mm. This is just another part of that 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 growth, you know what I mean? Yeah. So oh, that's awesome. Hey, thank you again for being here. Uh, no again. Eric, check him out. Gravity Movement. Instagram's the way to go. Check yes, him out sir. everywhere. Bandcamp. Uh, and you can check us out, Musicians and Makers, at our website, uh, as well as Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify. Uh, and if you know anyone or you would like to be on this show, please just uh, shoot us an email. Uh, we're looking to interview everyone. Everyone's opinions matter, and we're not shutting anybody down. So thank you again. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully talk to you soon when you have something new to show us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Quick to spit a verse with E-Rocks on the gray pad buttons in the lab with the extra percussionist.